Hello again, everybody. I'm Scott Casper. Of course, Tony Hager to my left. This is Global Wrestling News. Our top story, a major upset in Ann Arbor. It was Sunday where the 14th ranked Sooners of Oklahoma rolled past Michigan 23 to 12. Tony, the Sooners are either better than we thought or the Michigan Wolverines are not as good as we thought. Which is it? I mean, this is, you look at an upset, it's on paper as far as rankings go. I think just Oklahoma doesn't have enough people in the rankings, so that didn't help their team. Uh, a lot of, lot of up-and-coming freshmen probably in that that will be ranked in the future. I mean, we saw some big upsets there. So Upsets indeed. As a matter of fact, which one shocked you the most? I, I would say uh, right off the bat, uh, Ryan Milhoff over uh, Connor Yautzi at 125. Five. That was a big one. Um, there was another one that uh, Shane Tucker, he was up six points on Brian Murphy. Uh, he had to bow out for injury, but I mean, he, he was putting it to him up, you know, up six points halfway through the bout. Well, Cody Brewer obviously favored to win another national title this year. Do you see any other contenders on the Oklahoma roster? Uh, personally, I don't. I think uh, he is definitely the favorite to win at 33 or 41, wherever he decides to go. Oklahoma's got couple guys in the stable for maybe All-American status, but uh, no title contenders. What, are the, what does the win do to the national ranking? I mean, like I said, the, there'll, be, there'll be some people that I maybe uh, from that Oklahoma team that came up and showed up, uh, you know, Ryan Milhoff for, for starters uh, at yeah. 125. 125 is just so stacked that those guys just can't get in the, in the ranking because the, there is so many good ones. Knocking off somebody that is ranked uh, could help. So uh, I think with all that said, maybe you might see the, the shift for Oklahoma come up, Michigan go down a little bit. Obviously, you've got your opinion about the team. i got a surprise for you, the man that perhaps knows a little bit more about the team than you do. Let's go to Sooners head man, Mark Cody. Coach, welcome to the show. you got a lot to be proud of about the performance in Ann Arbor. Yeah, Scott, I really am. You know, they wrestled hard. Um, you know, we went in there, uh, I, I got to really hand it to my assistant coaches. They really laid down some great individual strategies, and and our guys stuck to them for the most part, and I think that was really the difference in a lot of the matches. Well, you guys showed a lot more aggression than we've seen over the last couple of years. Was that your focus in the off season? Yeah, and that's what we try to, to, to push to them. Uh, you know, in, in every practice, we talk to them about, you know, we can come up with all the strategies in the world, but – but the best strategy is for you to force your style on your opponent. And, um, you know, little by little, we're starting to do that um, and, and not really be too caught up in, in what our opponent does, but really uh, what's most important is what we do and what we're capable of, and we just have to go out there and execute. And I think they really did a good job with that. Well, we talk a lot about Isaiah Martinez, Alex Derringer, Nick Wazdowski, but pound for pound, how good is Cody Brewer? Yeah, I think pound for pound, he's probably, in my eyes, and of course I'm biased, he's the best wrestler in the country. I think he, he does everything right. He's worked so hard this year, all year long. You know, he took a week off after the national tournament last year and just hit the ground running. And you would have thought he never won a title because he's still so hungry, you know, and he's really going after that next title a lot harder than he did for the, for the last one and, and he, he works at a very high level so it's pretty impressive that he could take it um you know to a whole nother level this uh summer you know through the uh, preseason so he's just done a, a really good job and, and he's a great kid and a great student just he's a coach's dream <laughs> well cody gets a lot of the spotlight for obvious reasons but clark glass is really starting to develop he's great he's uh he does everything right and he works too hard uh, for something, you know, he, he works, you know, as hard as anybody in the country. And I know great things are going to happen for him because of, of, of the work that he puts in. He does, you know, everything that you ask of him. And, uh, you know, he works so hard that, you know, it's going to pay off for him. I, I just know it is. And, uh, you know, he's getting better and better in every match. All right, Coach, good luck at the Vegas Invitational, and thanks for helping me surprise Hager. Great. Thanks a lot, Scott. I appreciate it. We're looking forward to it. All right, fans, we need to take a quick time out. Stay tuned. More Global Wrestling News. All right, welcome back to GWN. We're now joined by a very special guest. He's the top-ranked wrestler in the world at 97 kilos, but not even old enough to buy a lottery ticket. Kyle, is it hard to watch Ohio State wrestle from the sidelines? 
It actually wasn't too bad watching from the sidelines. I, I knew before the duel meet started that I obviously wasn't going to be getting a match. And uh, the first duel meet that I went to was against Arizona State. So it wasn't um, too difficult. You know, I was just happy that I could be there supporting the guys from Ohio State and watching some of my close friends compete. But there was definitely a couple times throughout the throughout the matches where I wanted to get out there and wrestle somebody. No, no, I don't regret my decision at all. I think that uh, it was the right move for me for my, you know, my ultimate goal is to be the best wrestler in the world this year at the Olympic Games. And I think that this, I've, I've already progressed since the World Championships. I feel like I've gotten bigger and stronger, better conditioned, and better technique already. And I still have about four and a half months to the trials. So it was a good decision for sure. You've been obviously helping the team. What have you been doing? Well, I haven't been any. I haven't been to any opens. Um, I was at a training camp in Colorado Springs when the first couple of opens took took place. So uh, I wasn't at any of those. But I'm in the room every day when I'm when I'm in Columbus with those guys practicing and training. Uh, you know, I come in the mornings and drill with some of the guys. I lift with them, condition with them on the weekends. So and basically anything that they need. For me, uh, technically, or just talking to them about the mental approach or just joking around and having fun, uh, I try to be there for them. And they help me just as much as I help them. So it's definitely a give-and-take relationship. Why did you choose not to compete in Iran with Titan Mercury? Well, after the World Championships, um, you know, a bunch of people started asking for me to come do appearances and come do clinics and stuff like that. So the month of November is kind of where I set all those dates up. And I was traveling so much. And I was, you know, flew from Colorado Springs to New York, New York to Maryland, Maryland to L.A., L.A. to Columbus. And then I finally kind of just got to settle down and get back to training. So I didn't, I didn't want to go to Iran and not be fully prepared and not be – not train the way that I normally do for an event. So the next time I'm competing is December 12th in Brazil, which which will be a good date for me. So I'll get a lot of training in before then, and I'll be feeling good. But stinks. I mean, all, I set up all that stuff before I even knew about um, the trip to Iran. But hope they do great. Should be some good wrestling. How has life on campus changed since winning a world title? Life on campus... Well, I don't really go on campus too much because I don't have to take classes. So I'm kind of just in my apartment chilling out. But um, it's kind of cool. It's it's cool, I guess. I mean, I like we'll go to football games sometimes and people will come up and ask to take pictures and they'll recognize me, which is uh, pretty fun. And, uh, you know, it's it's everything seems to seems to be pretty normal. Uh, I've, I've talked to a couple of the sport teams at Ohio State, which has been fun for me, getting to talk to some other athletes about the way I think about competing and how I was able to have success at such a young age. But um, other than that, everything's been pretty normal. Here's a good question. What happened to that $50,000 check from the Living the Dream Medal Fund? So the ultimate solution, a lot of people, this hasn't been explained to anybody, but um, our compliance has got – you know, worked with me and explained to me the whole situation, talked to USA Wrestling. I actually I actually was able to cash that check and still have my eligibility because it comes through something called Operation Gold, which is through the United States Olympic Committee, and it's a one-time payment for the biggest competition of the year, which is the World Championships this year, which is the Olympic Games in 2016. And any amount of money that comes through that Operation Gold, I can accept in cash with no no problem with the NCAA and my eligibility. So um, a lot of people think, because um, nobody really knows what the deal was with it, and uh, glad that I get to talk about it so people understand now. But I was able to cash it, and um, I have all of it. So uh, that was pretty great, definitely. Uh, it was an amazing feeling getting that check. Well, he's the youngest world champ in U.S. history. Kyle Snyder has been our guest. Kyle, thanks for the time, bud, and good luck.
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. When we come back, Dan Gable's going to talk politics. Stick around. You're watching Global Wrestling News. Well, as one of, if not the most iconic name in the state of Iowa, presidential candidates from around the country are seeking an endorsement from Dan Gable. Local Channel 5's Elias Johnson, former Arizona State wrestler, recently sat down with the wrestling legend and talked a little politics. Moving to your local election headquarters now with Local 5's chief political correspondent, Amanda Krenz, and we are talking about presidential candidates spending time in Iowa in an effort to gain support and, of course, political endorsements. The right kind of support can have a ripple effect for Republicans in the Hawkeye State. That's right. And few names carry as much notoriety as wrestling legend Dan Gable. Elias Johnson sat down with Gable, who's been meeting with candidates wanting his endorsement. Most recently, Republican frontrunner Donald Trump. What does it take to get a Dan Gable endorsement? Uh, you know, real simple. He's going to have to get my wife to give me the okay, Kathy. How uh, tough is that? Uh, that? It's pretty tough, but, uh, you know, I don't think it's as tough as maybe uh, it could be, just because I think she's already kind of been doing her homework and following. I just had to get rushed over here from meeting uh, Donald Trump today for the second time. I really wanted some time with him because I would like to know who I'm dealing with. You know, I, I hear, I read, you know, that, and I follow. But one-on-one -on -one kind of gives you a better indication. We still didn't get that. So, uh, you know, because his, I don't know if they accounted for the wind today in his, in his jet. And so, you know, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm a long ways away yet, but, but um, with that in mind, it's not too far away. Your name's been brought up, you know, Dan Gable, you should run for office, whether it be state level governor, any interest in running for elected office? Uh, you know, I looked into that. It took about four months. It kind of broke me. You know, I never really got broke too many times in wrestling, if ever. But uh, that, that business is, I don't know, it's more like, uh, I, I don't know if I want to hurt people, <laughs> you know. Just, uh, I, I mean, I like to hurt him on, on the mat. And uh, one guy t said, that's why you're one of the greatest of all time. You punished people, but that's on the wrestling mat. Uh, in life, on everyday affairs, uh, you know, I just, I don't like to shut people off. So I, it's, 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 it would be tough for me. I do like... I don't know, pretty interesting that he's so into politics, I, I think. Okay. By the way, he plans to meet with Marco Rubio before making up his mind on who he'll support. And Rubio is actually in the state, so maybe that's going to happen sometime soon. And defaulting to the wife, I kind of like that approach. <laughs> I know, I do too. Very smart on yeah. lots of fronts there. All right, that's thanks, so Amanda. True. We'll be hearing much more from Elias's discussion with Dan Gable this week right here on Local 5 as they talk about wrestling and what inspires Gable now that he is retired from that sport that he loves. And of course, you can follow along for all your latest political news on our website. We iowa.com did dan gable say that politics broke him that's probably the first time i ever heard dan gable admit to it and i don't believe it one bit though i mean he's an icon politics are dirty i mean you just never know what people will do to you know put his name through the mud i mean he's dan gable i think even that name could get put through the mud and when it comes to politics but what if dan gable endorsed donald trump what does that mean for wrestling trump was a wrestler I mean, he's a wrestler, so I mean, it makes sense. But uh, as, as Dan said, you know, it's uh, his wife that makes a decision. He's uh, he's in on politics, so he knows what's going on. So that one-on-one -on -one interaction from him is really what matters. He's not believing the hype. You know, first thing in my head would be uh, it's good. You know, maybe money. Money comes. Uh, that's what Trump's all about. And uh, you know, but Dan isn't about that. If he was, he would have got it at the gala event. He would have endorsed him right there on the spot, and you know, made that uh, made that event really special. Well, we'll look forward to more one-on-one -on -one time with Dan and Elias on future shows. Our very special thanks to our friends at Channel 5, the ABC affiliate here in Des Moines, Iowa, for sharing that fantastic story. Nice job, guys. Stick around. There's more wrestling news. That's after the break.
Last week, we talked about the possibility of Joe Warren coming back to the mat, and now it's official. It's an exclusive interview we conducted with the baddest man on the planet. He said he's just what the U.S. has been missing. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's what um, we have some time off here. So we just decided to put those shoes back on and try to make Olympic team. So uh, this is the first year in history that they don't pre-qualify ex-world champions for the Olympic team trials. Uh, so that's the plan was I was going to go wrestle Olympic team trials. But uh, Matt Lindlin took away that 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 plan of uh, be, having the ex world champs be able to just slide into Olympic team trials. So now I have to qualify. So I re- uh, decided, you know, a, f- a few days before um, the New York Athletic Club, I wanted to wrestle. So Bob Forrester, me, and Damian Logan, we decided. I just jumped on a plane and flew to New York and jumped on the scale. I weighed 150, wrestled 150. I was like the heaviest I ever wrestled, and. Uh, you know, I'll, I'm going to try to drop down to this 59 kilos for December 18th here at uh, the U.S. Open in Vegas. But uh, it's one step at a time here. So I've been in the wrestling room a lot, training, and still been still been punching. But I've been trying to get my timing back down in Greco. I got to give him props. I mean, after hearing right from him, I mean, knowing that he is training full time MMA, I'll admit I'm not a huge MMA guy, so I don't know what these guys go through. So. I mean, if he believes in himself, Matt Lindland believes in him, uh, that's got to be probably our best shot to hopefully get a Greco medal. I mean, we only had one medal at the World Championships, one medal, and it was a bronze. So something, they got to figure out something there. Well, i tell you who else believes in him. Steve Frazier believes in him. Randy Couture, Dan Henderson. The names go on and on. At 39 years old, he can not only fight, but he can wrestle. Remember, Couture and Henderson both fought at 45 and fought well. I think those guys are super athletes. I think the biggest thing with him right now that he said on the interview is he's just got to make the weight. That's a big weight cut. So make the weight first and then let's worry about getting you know on the Olympic team and then getting the medal. Well there's another former wrestler who's had a lot of success in MMA, 2008 Olympic gold medalist Henry Cejudo. After beating Jussier Formiga by unanimous decision, the messenger is probably next in line for a title shot. But he says he won't fight in Las Vegas until Nick Diaz is freed from his suspension. Tony, is it a mistake? I think it's a mistake on his part. I mean, no way he turns down a fight, especially a title fight. I mean, it's hard enough to get that and just to turn it down because of, uh, you know, maybe Nick Diaz's situation. I get that he's trying to stick up. Other athletes are coming out wanting to stick up for him, but he has to do what's best for him, and that's a, that's a title fight. That's, that's the big check. Dude, he wants justice for Diaz. Oh, of course he does. I, I get it, but, I mean, Nick Diaz would probably do the same thing. Do you think Diaz would turn down a title fight if the shoes were on the other foot? I definitely don't think so. I mean, I, I don't get that vibe from Nick, but I don't, I mean, we just see what he, I, I see in the public. And uh, if Diaz had a shot, he would take it. Putting it all out there, aren't we? Cordell's Dylan Palacio is out for the semester. We've just reported that. You'll see it on our website at takedownwrestle.com. He's maybe out for even longer. He's battled several health issues in the early season, including appendicitis. He took to Instagram to let the fans know. He said it was with a heavy heart that he has to announce that he'll be medically withdrawing from the school this semester with the intent to hopefully return as soon as he can. He says, my dad always told me that money is paper and only in good health do we experience true prosperity. Health issues and concerns have made me step away from the sport I love and now the school I've always dreamed about as well. It's sad, but without struggle, there is no glory. And I know my parents and everyone who knows me will truly comprehend how hard this decision was. As of now, the future is uncertain, but what is certain? That the realist will rise again. And he signs off with much love and God bless. It's tough for any wrestler, Tony. It's tough for anybody to walk away, but you know, he's a, he's a two-time NCAA qualifier. This is, a, this is a big blow, I'm sure, to obviously to him, but an even bigger blow to Cornell. You know, the appendix, uh, appendix is uh, definitely not something to uh, not worry about. I think, uh, you know, if you've got that pain in your stomach that, I, you know, people have just told me about, I mean, if, if that thing bursts, I mean, it's life-threatening. So oh, yeah. this is definitely serious. I can't, I couldn't even imagine wrestling with just a, you know, a, a pain in my stomach. So, I, you know, if he's got to step away, he's got to step away. Well, the timing couldn't be worse for Cornell because the early season competition is just getting a lot tougher. Things are really heating up. The Big Red and 11 other Division I programs will be at Madison Square Garden Sunday for the fourth annual Grapple at the Garden. The field will include Big Ten powers like Nebraska, Illinois, Northwestern, and Rutgers, along with several other rising programs around the country. 
Cornell will open against Nebraska in what should be a very close duel. Tony, who do you see in this one? I, Cor Cornell overall has a, a proven team up and down the lineup, but you know Nebraska is going to have something to say. They've got some young and upcoming wrestlers uh, looking for those upsets. The biggest matches to look at, 133, number four, Nashawn Garrett against number nine, Eric Montoya. And at 184, that will showcase number one ranked Gabe Dean. Number five, TJ Dudley. I like that one. Th these are the swing matches of the duel, so keep your eye on that one at Grapple. Well, I'm at number two. George Mason will take on Rutgers. How impressive have the Scarlet Knights been so far? You know, one uh, first name and three last names can take this team as far as they want this weekend. Anthony Garaldo, Ashnault, and... Parati. Did I guess it right? Yep, Parati. You got it. It's another <laughs> Anthony, and, and all of these guys really are the backbone of the Rutgers team. So... Know the name Anthony when you're watching the Rutgers. Right. All right, Tony, it's time for us to sign off for the week. Our executive producer, Andrew F. Barth. It's a very special thank you we send out on his behalf to each and every one of you for he does what he does for the sport of wrestling with a big and genuine and generous heart. Also for Wayne Boyd, Wayne Eric Boyd. What a, what a legend we have in Wayne Boyd. For Tony Hager, all of our cast and crew here, I'm Scott Casper. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and we'll talk to you next week.